7. Pointing the finger. All right, Mr. Blake, growled the young Lockheed rep. You've got your two phone calls and 24 hours to explain your part in this mess. I'd make sure one of the calls is to your lawyer. That's all I need, Paladin replied. By this time tomorrow, I'll have it all sorted out. At least, he thought, I'd better. If he didn't get to the bottom of this dizzy affair, Blake would end up taking the rap for the theft of the prototype. He dialed. The line rang eight times before Dashiel picked up. Hello? A sleepy voice asked. Dashiel? It's Paladin. I need a favor. Round up on your buddy on the Hollywood PD. What's his name? Sloghauser? Then bail Jimmy the Rap out of whatever drunk tank he's in. Get them all out to the Lockheed Pasadena airfield by noon. That's three favors, Dashiel said, and yawned. I suppose this is an emergency, a matter of life and death. Yeah, my life and death. There was silence on the other end, then... Very well, then. I'll see what I can do. One more thing, Paladin said. Get to my Santa Monica office. Bring that fancy detective kit with the fingerprint equipment. If we're lucky as hell, you'll find the break I need. Paladin quickly outlined what he wanted it for. It's a hundred to one shot, Deshiel replied. Try anyway, Paladin told him. He hung up, then rang Tennyson. Tennyson was his business partner. Paladin had met the Englishman during the Great War, then hooked up with him again after Blake's brief stint with the Pinkertons. Tennyson had taught him how to fight and fly and kill and be a gentleman all at the same time. Has the cleaning woman come, Tennyson? Paladin asked. Yes? Well, chase her out of my office. I need it intact and messy, just the way I left it. Paladin heard the receiver drop and exchanged on the other end in heated Spanish, and then Tennyson picked up and reported. She's gone. Good. Let the shield in when he gets there. He'll fill you in. Then get to Lockheed's Pasadena Airfield with your tools and be ready for anything. Consider it done, Tennyson replied. Paladin set the phone back in the cradle and looked up. Mr. Cologne and the older Lockheed official exchanged an incredulous glance. Then the older man asked Paladin, Will you require anything else? I'll need you to fly my people here. I also need the personal files of your security people at the Pasadena airfield. The older man told his associate, Ship the files Mr. Blake requires on the next flight out. I could use a little lunch, maybe a shower too. Paladin said, scratching the stubble on his skin. And a decent razor so I can clean up. Or, Paladin thought, so I can cut my throat if this daffy scheme doesn't work. The transport plane landed at half past one that afternoon. There were no windows in the passenger section of the fuselage. Lockheed wasn't taking any chances of revealing the location of its secret testing facility. Tennyson sauntered off the plane first, lightly stepping down the stairway as if he were the Duke of Kent in tails and black tie at the Queen's reception. He was, in fact, wearing a set of freshly pressed white coveralls, a Hollywood star's baseball cap, and mirrored aviator glasses. He carried a bulky tool chest in each hand. When Tennyson saw Paladin, he set his tools down, clasped Paladin's hand, and patted him on the back. So good to see you, my friend. A smile split his white beard, then disappeared. We had been told there was an accident and that you were injured. That's the least of my problems, Paladin muttered, and absentmindedly massaged his bandaged shoulder. Jimmy the Rap got off the plane next. His crumpled suit looked like it had been slept in, and he winced when he got a dose of desert sun. Following Jimmy was a pudgy man in a navy blue suit and a worn fedora that had cop written all over it. That had to be Detective Sloghauser. Last to deplane was a giant of a man, the Russian fighter ace who had gotten Paladin into this mess, Peter Justin. Where's Dashiel? Paladin asked. He did not come, Tennyson replied. He said the only desert he would be going to would be Palm Springs. All the others were too dry, he told me and I do not believe he was referring to the climate. 
Paladin gritted his teeth. That's it? He didn't say anything else? He told me to give you this. Tennyson reached into the vest pocket of his coveralls, removed an envelope, and handed it to Paladin. He said, your long shot paid off, and that you owe him a bottle of champagne. Paladin cracked it open and frowned at its contents. Hmm, huh. it isn't as clear as I'd hoped, he whispered. Still, we're lucky we got anything at all. It'll have to do. What will have to do? Tennyson asked. A miracle, if I can pull it off, Paladin said. He stuffed the envelope into his pocket. Mr. Blake, asked the voice embellished with a Slavic accent. Paladin turned. Peter Justin, all seven feet and three hundred pounds of him, had somehow crept up behind him. Justin's pointed beard had been immaculately trimmed since Paladin had seen him last. He wore a light gray silk suit and a Panama hat to shade his face. It is most distressing news about the prototype, he said. I very much would like to see the wreckage. He shot a suspicious glance at Tennyson and then looked back down at Paladin. If there is anything I can do to help, please tell me. Paladin took a step back. Did you bring those Lockheed employment records? Of course. Justin hefted an alligator skin briefcase. Good. Paladin nodded toward the hangar. He raised his voice so everyone on the field heard him. Then let's take a look at the plane. He marched to the hangar. Across the dry lake bed, shimmering heat rose in waves so it looked like an oasis in the distance. A mirage. A reminder that maybe it wasn't the truth he was chasing, just smoke and mirrors. No, his hunch had to be right. Paladin stepped through the door adjacent to the gigantic hangar bay entrance. The temperature inside was 20 degrees cooler, and Paladin's sweat immediately chilled his skin to goose flesh. A trio of armed guards scrutinized him and reached for their sidearms. They relaxed, though, when they saw the older Lockheed official and Mr. Cologne. The prototype was the only plane in the cavernous building. She was parked in the center, and a spotlight painted her steel with reflections and glare. Paladin could see the scrapes and scorch marks from their close calls and felt sorry that he'd banged up the beautiful craft. First thing, Paladin said, trying to sound like he knew what he was doing. I'll need my chief mechanic to look over the plane. Absolutely not, Mr. Cologne said, stepping between Paladin and the plane and raising his neatly manicured hands. You've done enough damage. For all we know, you're trying to steal more technical data and sell it to our competitors. If you think I already stole the prototype, Paladin replied, lowering his tone and meeting Mr. Cologne's stare, and if I already had it to examine for an entire day, what could it possibly hurt for me to take one more look? Mr. Cologne considered, cupping his dimpled chin. Then he said, Very well, but I insist on one of our mechanics watch you. Good, Tennyson remarked. He started to lug his tools to the plane. We could always use a little help. Detective Sloghauser cleared his throat. Is this something the Hollywood police needs to look at? I was told a plane here was stolen. Stolen and recovered, Mr. Cologne said. We already have the thief. All that we require of you is to take him into custody. Paladin crossed his arms so he'd be less likely to take a poke at Mr. Cologne, who was really starting to get under his skin. There'll be a charge of espionage to add, maybe even a count or two of treason. Detective Sloghauser raised his eyebrows and tipped up his fedora. That's so. The suit here has it wrong, though, Paladin continued. I'm not the thief. He turned to Mr. Cologne, and what he thinks was stolen wasn't. Jimmy the Rap looked nervously about, as if he were suddenly claustrophobic in the immensely empty hangar. Don't no one go putting a finger on me. He backed away from Paladin. I was in lockup for the last two days. I didn't take nothing. Shut your trap, Detective Slughauser barked. He scratched his head, then asked, So what's going on, Blake? I know you're on the up and up. Spell it out for me, but in English, huh? I will. I'll even gift wrap the thief for you, complete with the details on how they did it, and their motive. But I'll need to ask everyone a few questions first. 
Powell then glanced from Justin to the older Lockheed official, to Detective Sloghauser, to Jimmy the Rat. Then I'll reveal which one of us is the crook. This is outrageous, Mr. Cologne said. I must agree, Justin murmured. I ain't done nothing, Jimmy said, and edged toward the door. Detective Sloghauser grabbed Jimmy by his wrinkled collar and marched him back. But one of us did steal the prototype, Paladin told them. In a way. Mr. Justin, Paladin said, take a careful look at this plane. Is it the one you sent me out in two days ago? Justin removed a set of spectacles from his coat pocket. He circled the sleek craft. It is a close approximation of our prototype, but... His forehead crinkled as he searched for the right word. More refined, as if a movie studio reproduced it from a picture, perhaps. Not quite, Paladin said. The real prototype? Justin inquired. I have been told it was crashed. I was shot down. It's completely destroyed. A pity all that is left is this forgery, Justin said. Is it? Paladin asked. Jimmy, two nights ago you told me about some parts that left the Lockheed facility in Pasadena. Parts belonging to a prototype? How would I know about that stuff? Jimmy squeaked. Detective Sloghauser slapped Jimmy on the back of his head. Because you're a fence for every jewel thief, burglar, and high roller in Los Angeles. Answer the man's question. Okay, some stuff walked out of Lockheed, sure. You hear things on the street. That ain't against the law. And these were high big ticket items, too. A pair of engines, a fuselage, and some newfangled air brake. Impossible, Justin said. Those items would have been missed. Paladin asked Detective Sloghauser. Do you think it's possible? Nah, couldn't be done. Slughauser replied. Not the way Lockheed's got the airfield locked up, and not with the Hollywood police on the job. Besides, why risk moving the parts if it was a spy job? Why not just scram with the blueprints? Paladin turned to Mr. Cologne. Can you think of a reason, other than espionage, that your prototype might be stolen? Sabotage, for starters. That plane represents a year and half of development and investments. It will cost a fortune to replace, if we can replace it at all. Tennyson slammed the engine compartment shut and then returned, wiping the grease from his hands with a rag. The plane is a jigsaw of sorts, Paladin. The fuselage, engines, and other components are missing any manufacturer's serial number. The remainder of the plane appears to be off-the-shelf materials. A hydrodyne water pump, Delco wiring, top-flight tires. Good, Paladin said. Very good. One more thing. Tennyson said in a low whisper so only Paladin could hear. I don't know what the old girl has been through, but I wouldn't take her up in the air. She's got stress fractures up and down her frame. An engine block is cracked. It's a wonder you made it back to the ground in one piece, old boy. Excuse me, Mr. Cologne demanded. What does this prove? Paladin ignored him. One last question. Can I see those files you brought, Mr. Justin? Justin opened his briefcase and handed over a stack of manila file folders. Paladin flipped through the paperwork until he found the one he wanted. He checked the fingerprint on record. Ah, there we are, he said with a smile. You wanted answers? Well, I've got some. Let's start with this prototype. Paladin pointed to the plane in the center of the hangar. The real Lockheed prototype. The one that was stolen piece by piece from Pasadena, and then reassembled. Its fuselage, the engines and air brake system all match the list of stolen goods our friend Jimmy provided. The parts that weren't swiped from Lockheed were replaced by the best fitting parts available. But that doesn't add up, Blake, Detective Slughauser said. If this thief could have gotten big items like the fuselage, they should have been able to grab them all. No, Paladin answered. Our thief needed an alibi. They used the remaining parts to build a mock prototype, one that would have never passed the close scrutiny it would have received had she ever reached this test facility. But it was good enough to shoot down, and good enough to send me up in to play the patsy. Justin reached into his coat. Not so fast, Detective Slughauser said, and drew his pistol. Justin slowly removed a silver case, opened it, 
and took out a cigarette. Detective Slughauser relaxed and lowered his revolver. It saddens me to hear this from you, Mr. Blake, Justin nonchalantly replied as he lit the cigarette. I would have thought that you would have taken responsibility for your mistakes rather than try to shift the blame with some implausible story. I have proof. Paladin removed the envelope from his pocket. He withdrew the card inside and showed everyone the half-smeared fingerprint. I think you'll find this print, which we lifted off the plane, matches the print on Mr. Justin's personal record. He handed the card and Justin's file to the older Lockheed official. I took the liberty of borrowing a friend's fingerprint kit and had Tennyson dust the plane. Paladin held his breath, hoping that his bluff sounded only half as phony as he thought. Justin shrugged. If this plane was stolen Lockheed parts, then my fingerprints should be on it. I supervised every phase of the production of the prototype parts. True enough. However, your prints are on the other parts, too. Paladin said, on parts that you should have never touched. Justin examined the glowing tip of his cigarette. He straightened his arm. There was a click, and a slim silver thirty-eight popped from the sleeve of his silk suit and into his massive hand. Moving with deceptive agility for such a large man, Peter Justin stepped behind Mr. Cologne, locked him in a stranglehold, and pointed his gun at the Lockheed executive's neck. Drop your weapons, Justin growled. Back away or this man dies. 8. One Way Out Paladin took a step toward Peter Justin. Don't do it, Justin. His words echoed through the cavernous hangar. There's nowhere to go. Tennyson took a step closer, trying to flank the massive Russian. Paladin gave him a short shake of his head and Tennyson froze in his tracks. Justin twisted the neck of his captive and pushed the muzzle of his gun deep into his target's throat. I disagree, Justin hissed. He backed away, using Mr. Cologne as a shield between himself and the trio of armed guards and Detective Sloghauser, moving closer to the prototype. I will be flying away from this place. No way, Slughauser said. The cop steadied his grip on his thirty-eight, trying to aim past the squirming hostage, hoping for a clear shot at Justin. The older Lockheed official set his hand on Slughauser's arm. No, detective. Let him go. Slughauser muttered something Paladin didn't quite catch. He lowered his gun. How much influence did Lockheed have with the Hollywood police? Paladin thought that Hughes was the big player in Hollywood. But a man like Slughauser didn't back down in the middle of a standoff, not unless someone with a lot of clout was pulling his strings. Paladin dismissed that thought and focused his attention on Justin. Why'd you do it? Paladin asked. Was it the money? How much did the pale man pay you? That stopped Justin more effectively than the threat of Slughauser's gun. He stood straighter crinkled his bushy eyebrows, and looked like Paladin had just slapped him in the face. I thought a man like you would understand, Blake. This was never about the money. Justin's eyes were steel-hard and stared through Paladin. Blake had seen the look before on the soldiers and flyers from the Great War, half shell-shocked and full of the reflections of dead friends. Paladin hazarded a guess. So that's it. You're a patriot. White Russian to the core, huh? Maybe you don't fly against the Reds anymore, but you're still fighting for Tsar and country. Justin relaxed his grip on the young Lockheed official, who managed to finally gasp and inhale a full breath. Then you do understand, Justin whispered. Well, I sure as hell don't, Slughauser muttered. Alaska, Tennyson offered and tugged thoughtfully at his white beard. Our Mr. Justin is from Alaska, and before that from Russia, a soldier of their revolution. When the white Russians were ousted by the Reds, Paladin continued, a bunch of them lit out for Alaska. Da, Justin growled. He tightened his grip on his captive and took a step back. 
The Reds and Whites are still going at it up there, Paladin said. The Reds want the last of the aristocrats dead. If half the reports are true, the fighting up north is twice as bloody as the Glorious Revolution. Innocent civilians are getting planted, all in the name of Mother Russia. The Pale Man, as you called him, Justin replied, promised me planes, guns, supplies, even a combat zeppelin in exchange for the prototype. He glanced quickly over his shoulder to the flying wing, then back. My people need these things, or all will be dead within a month. There are other ways, the older Lockheed official said. We can negotiate. We will negotiate nothing, Justin spat. He dragged his captive backward to the prototype. Capitalists and police, he sneered. I trust you less than I trust the communists. He nodded to Paladin and added, I must thank you, Mr. Blake, for returning the prototype. I shall bring it to the Pale Man. Perhaps it will not be too late for my people. Don't do it, Paladin cautioned. The planes had it. Justin smiled. A few bullet holes will not stop me from flying this plane. It's not only the exterior damage, Tennyson told him. Look for yourself. She's got stress fractures up and down her frame. The block is cracked, and the intakes are... Justin ignored Tennyson and sat on the wing's leading edge. He saddled back, pulling the young Lockheed official up on the wing with him as if he weighed no more than a rag doll. Mr. Cologne let out a strangled squeal. With more dexterity than a man Justin's size should have possessed, he eased into the cockpit, dragging Mr. Cologne with him. Stay calm, people. Let them go, the older Lockheed official said, glacially cool. He slicked back his neat white hair, then gestured at the guards to back off. The three Lockheed guards lowered their weapons. No! Paladin protested. There are alternatives to fisticuffs and gunplay, Mr. Blake, the older man admonished, as our Mr. Justin is about to learn. Justin closed the canopy. The prototype's engines roared to life, and the aircraft eased forward. Paladin backed away from the plane's twin 30 caliber machine guns. The older Lockheed official signaled the guards to open the hangar doors. For the first time in his life, Paladin almost wished one man could escape the law. Justin was a warrior, a patriot. Maybe he had done the only thing possible in his desperate situation. Maybe he'd done what Blake himself would do if the situation had been reversed. The flying wing rumbled onto the runway. Paladin and the others ran outside. The sun was high, and heat shimmered off the dry lake bed. The prototype accelerated down the runway, then arced into the air. It banked left, pulled up higher, climbed toward the glaring sun, and disintegrated into bits of spinning wing and confetti metal, a spray of fuel and fire and smoke. Paladin's insides ran cold. That could have been him. Maybe it should have been him. And Justin, one of the last white Russian resistance fighters, should have walked away from this mess alive. He turned to the older Lockheed official, whose gray eyes were squinting at the smoky scar in the sky. You said there were other alternatives, Paladin growled. Like what? Like, the older man shrugged, we can always build another plane. Paladin clenched his fists and stepped toward the Lockheed rep. Detective Sloghauser reached into his overcoat pocket and shook his head. Paladin stopped in his tracks. The older gentleman ignored Paladin's clenched teeth and hate-filled stare. He calmly asked, Dinner, Mr. Blake? The Lockheed secret airfield, the wreckage of the prototype, and the sweltering desert sun were a hundred miles away and twelve hours in the past. Still, Paladin hadn't quite washed the sandy grit or the bad taste of the incident from his mouth. Paladin straightened his tuxedo and sipped ice water. He avoided looking at the prime rib and the martini that had been ordered for him, nor did he look at the swing band or the dancing feather girls on the stage of Oscars, 
a ritzy hole in the wall for Hollywood's movie moguls and power brokers. From the steely-eyed bouncers to the well-bribed maitre d', the message was plain, no party crashers allowed. The older Lockheed official sat across the table from him. He wore a light gray tuxedo that matched his eyes and hair. His name was Dunford, James Dunford. Since they returned, Paladin and James were on a first-name basis. He was very grateful to Paladin for wrapping up his problems, the missing prototype, and the elusive Peter Justin. He was even more grateful that Blake Aviation Security had a policy about keeping its mouth permanently shut about clients' cases. Unless there's some illegal activity the police should know of, Paladin added. I assure you, Paladin, Dunford said with a smile, Lockheed engages only in legal activities and commerce. Legal activities and commerce might, however, cover a lot of territory if the pol Hollywood police were looking the other way. Come to think of it, Detective Sloghauser hadn't said a word after the plane crash. Would a report get filed? Or would the incident and the death of two Lockheed employees be swept under the rug? Paladin leaned closer to Dunford, wrinkling the white linen tablecloth. You knew about the plane. Knew it would fall apart? Of course, Dunford said calmly and cut into his porterhouse. The frame was a special aluminum alloy designed for lightweight, but with reduced tensile properties. I am amazed it held together for your aerial combats, Mr. Blake. He chewed. Remarkable. Paladin had an urge to reach across the table and, if not strangle Dunford, at least blacken his eye. Maybe both, Blake thought. He's just too damn smug for his own good. Paladin reined in his impulse, though. The theft of the prototype, the Russian connection, and Lockheed's apparent control of the police were all part of a much larger and more sinister picture. If he wanted to find out what was really going on, Paladin had to keep his cool and play along. It wasn't easy. I assume, Dunford said, that you found our retainer sufficient? Very, Paladin replied. Sufficient didn't cover it. Lockheed had paid him a considerable sum to retain Blake Aviation Security on a semi-permanent basis for what Dunford called special operations. The kind of money they dished out would keep his offices from here to the Empire State in black ink for the next two years. Dunford set his fork and knife down and riveted Paladin with his eyes. How did you know Mr. Justin was our thief? Paladin found himself unable to hold Dunford's stare. He looked instead at his martini. It was cool and clear and shimmering silver. It would be easy to sip to drink the thing down. He inhaled the faint scent of gin, then reluctantly slid the glass toward the middle of the table. It was the cigarettes, Paladin finally said. Dunford eased back, raised an eyebrow, and then retrieved his own package of cigarettes. He shook one out for himself and offered one to Paladin. No thanks, Paladin said to the offered smokes. I found a pack of European cigarettes on the Pale Man Zepp. You know, the kind wrapped with the black papers. They're hard to get in North America these days, especially in Hollywood. True, Dunford examined his plain white lucky strikes and then lit up. So I can assume our Mr. Justin smoked the same European brand, yes? That could have been mere coincidence. Yes, it could have, Paladin conceded. Hell, it may even have been a coincidence, but who else was in a position to steal the major components for the prototype from the Pasadena plant? Who was the only person to see me off in that mock prototype? Who arranged the flight schedule to ensure that my takeoff didn't lead to any inconvenient witnesses? All the pieces fit. That bit about the fingerprints, Dunford chuckled. It was a dazzling display of deduction, Mr. Blake. Thanks. Paladin muttered. In fact, there had been no deduction. Tennyson hadn't found a single fingerprint on the prototype. He had, however, lifted one of Justin's prints from Paladin's desk in his Santa Monica office. That was the print Paladin had handed Justin, 
The print Blake had compared to his Lockheed employment record. It had been nothing more than flimflam. As far as Paladin was concerned, though, no one at Lockheed ever had to know that little detail of the case. Dunford wiped his mouth with a napkin and covered his plate with it. Very good, but now on to new business, Mr. Blake, or rather, a continuation of our old business. Our retainer is conditional on Blake Aviation Security following through on this case. What case? Paladin asked. This whole mess is wrapped up. You got your plane back. Most of it, anyway. There's no need to feign naivete, Mr. Blake, Dunford said, and grinned. There will be a bonus upon completion of your investigation, of course, but I must insist that you continue. This pale man must be found. You must find him. Dunford paused to sip his martini. When you locate him, and I do not doubt that you will, there shall be no need to immediately involve the authorities. The pale man's day of reckoning will come in a court of law, but Lockheed would like to have a word with him first. I see. Dunford wasn't only buying Blake Aviation Security Service, he was also buying his silence. Why? What did Lockheed want with the pale man? Revenge? The pale man had promised Justin planes and guns, men and even a military zep. Where the hell was he getting that equipment? And why was he so willing to give it away? He was risking the wrath of Lockheed and bringing the entire nation of Hollywood to a boil, not to mention the lives that would be spent in bitter conflict in Alaska. That was a lot of heat for one plane, fancy prototype or not. Sure, Paladin said finally. I'll find him. Paladin would find the pale man all right, but for his own reasons. And one thing is for damn sure, he thought, before Lockheed or the Hollywood police ever get to talk to this mysterious pale man, I'm going to have my own question and answer session first. When Paladin learned the truth, no one, not Lockheed, not the police, not the entire nation of Hollywood, would stand in his way of seeing justice done.